now we switch uh, to an area which might be a little bit out of our focus. Uh, and on purpose, we invited a speaker from the South African country, reflecting on the swine production in the South African continent. Please welcome Peter Grimbeck. Peter is a private consultant in South Africa. He graduated from the University of Pretoria in 1974. Uh, and spent now 32 years as a consultant uh, in the field. Uh, but not only that, Peter is a hands-on farmer. Peter is running a 1,800 South operation, uh, including the abattoir. And just by the way, because there might be still time on Sunday, he is operating a 900 hectare cattle farm. Uh, so Peter seems to be quite busy. Peter will talk, as the previous speakers, uh, also to this topic, different regions, similar challenges. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. The sixth century Chinese philosopher, Lai Tzu, said, a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. Our small South African pig industry is traveling, often, ladies and gentlemen, at a breakneck speed. We sometimes have no plan, we sometimes lose our way, we're forced into many detours, we encounter potholes in the road, but we intend to arrive. Let me share with you the South African vision. We've all heard about the Chinese economic miracle. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We all know, being pork farmers in the pork industry, what has happened to pork meat consumption in the world. But here's a little sad table for the South Africans. If you look at the per capita pork consumption, there we are, second from the bottom with 3.8 kilograms. South Africa, ladies and gentlemen, produces less than 1% of all the pork produced in the world. It's frightening that the inhabitants of a city like Sao Paulo in Brazil would consume nearly twice our annual South African pork production. That puts it into context for the audience. South Africa is a country of more than 50 million people. It's culturally very diversified. It's got 11 official languages. And I'm not very proud to s say it's got one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world. That's the difference between the very rich and the very poor. And that is a political problem that we have in our country. It's no secret that we have suffered from a, a, a distasteful political disposition for 50 years to a fairly fruitful democracy since 1994. That is more or less the meat consumption in South Africa, and you can see it's dominated by poultry, and then by beef, and fish, and pork, and mutton. And of course, it's beef that traditionally, amongst the African consumer, that drives the meat industry. But it's poultry because of its availability and its cost, affordability, that leads the market. We have about, ladies and gentlemen, 105,000 breeding sows in the formal sector. I call it the formal sector. It's got world-class facilities, and it's got, in my opinion, world-class performance. We have approximately 30,000 sows in the rural areas in a very poorly developed third world situation. That's our sl slaughterings from 2008. And if you can see how we've grown until 2013, we've slaughtered 2.6 million pigs. And those of you who are mathematically inclined can easily work out 103 sows, 2.6 million pigs. We're slaughtering about 25 and a half pigs per sow killed, which is not bad. Um, our country is divided into nine provinces. And if you can see the Western Cape right in the middle there, that's Mediterranean climate. It really is wine and wheat and wool and barley and hops and canola. The rest of the country is maize and soya, and we base our diets on the American corn soy systems. Pareto's rule applies, as I think maybe in all countries in the world, that 20% of our producers 
produce about 80% of all the pork. We have similar worldwide trends applying, and farms are getting larger, and family farms are slowly dwindling. The new farmers uh, are, are building up to 5,000 sow units, and we have very good professional managers with well-defined targets, KPIs, and they are the order of the day. South Africa has been a net importer of pork since the 1990s. Pork is imported, it's predominantly ribs. South Africans don't eat pork, but they do eat spare ribs. They don't see it as pork, it's just a wonderful restaurant cut, and it's followed by other frozen cuts. Our imports are about 8% of annual production. Exports have averaged less than 1%, so we're not an export-orientated country. And the main destinations for our, our pork are to other African countries, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, Mauritius, Seychelles, even Kenya, Uganda. But as our industry is maturing and producers are getting more sophisticated, it may be that imports to larger pork-consuming nations of the East may be a viable option in the future, and we're already speaking to countries like Singapore. Exports, of course, as you know, are dependent on, on a continual surplus, and our small industry cannot always meet this. Therefore, the export industry always suffers, and we will have to look at a push-pull demand for this to realize fruition. 60% of our pork is marketed through the supermarkets, and like any country in the world, they're very strong. I think they're often ruthless. Of course, they're very professional. They are profit-driven, and they have a very big influence on how we farm with pigs and will, in future, uh, even be more ruthless. 35% is marketed through smaller family butchers and the balance through the informal market. These are just two brands we have in S South Africa, Escort and Enterprise, and it would be very similar to other well-known world brands in your own countries. This is a worrying thing that always worries pork producers. The, the grey at the bottom is the margin in the value chain made by the producer. The yellow is made by the, by the packer, and the, and the blue is made by the retail chains. And you can see exactly what's happened. The variation or the increase in, in profitability right at the end of the chain is always far more than what the producer makes. These are just a, f a few prices in South Africa, and this was taken last year when the price to South African pork producers fell. And you can see that in the trade, it went up eight. There's Gassler ribs that went down 10. I don't quite know why. But all the prices went up and the farmers got less. This is the meat to maize price ratio in South Africa. And the interesting figure here, ladies and gentlemen, would be that from about 2014 up in orange is pork. And we would be very close to chicken and be able to produce pork as economically as the poultry farmers. Farmers in South Africa are not farmers anymore, they are risk managers. And in the past three years or four years, like any other country in the world, we've had unbelievable, unbelievable volatility in input costs. And you can see that between May of 2013 and January of 2014, white maize 46, yellow maize 49 up, soya beans 34, beef 7, lamb 10, pork 9. So we were under a lot of pressure. It has improved. We've had a record maize crop, and the prices have certainly come down. The future. At the recent Bureau for Food and Agricultural Policy Symposium in, in Pretoria last month, the following 10-year scenario was proposed. You can have a look at meat consumption growth in South Africa. And between 2001 and 2013, beef went up 12%, chicken 81, mutton 
minus 17. Pork grew the 53 and eggs 33. The next 10 years will show the following. Beef 20, ch chicken 34, sheep 15 from a low base, pork 41 and eggs 27. So from a very small market, the pork market in South Africa looks to have a good future growth. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong way. Welfare. We heard about the welfare problems in Denmark, and we have exactly the same. Castration and sour crates are the two big problems. And we've all read the international literature, we understand it, we read Pig Progress every week. Interesting thing about South Africa, we produce mainly entire males. As our slaughter masses are increasing, as our industry matures, from an average carcass mass of 67 kilos to 80 and 85 and even 90, the risk of boar taint increases. Therefore, in South Africa, the use of Improvac or Improvest, which is not used in many other countries, it's the immune vaccine, is continuously increasing, and I like the product immensely. Group sour housing. It is our intention to be fully compliant by 2020. Many producers already have nearly 100% of their reproduction chain as loose house or in groups, in groups, barring, of course, that post-weaning period in which the, the sows are moved into AI stalls. It is our South African standard that at least 50%, that's the first eight weeks of the, of the gestation period, would be in crates, and the second eight weeks would move into group sow housing. Here's a, f a photograph of one of our farms. There are eight sows in a group. They are eight weeks pregnant. They are sized up. They are floor fed, individually fed. There are eight feeders in a pen and the sows are hand-picked according to their P2s, their ages, their parities, to minimize competition. There's an, another farm that's just been built, modern flooring, uh, slats, plastic walls, and there are groups of eight, and then eight, and, and then 16. Um, we also have, like you would have in Holland and in, in Denmark and in many European countries, Canada, America, Mexico even, we have um, the transponder systems. But I think many farmers like this system. It's a little bit cheaper to put in with the shoulder crates and ample space for the animals to move. You just have to manage the system. The strength of our industries, it's a small, well-organized and dynamic industry. We have a producer organization called SAPO, South African Poor Producer Organization. It lobbies on behalf of primary producers. We have access to top quality genetic material, I think reasonably good veterinary support, and we have nutritional excellence. There's an efficient grading and a classification system at abattoir <coughs> level. We have very strong biosecurity, and in my opinion, our industry has a superior health status compared to many of the countries I've seen in the rest of the world. Our producers at this very moment in time are investing significant amounts of capital into world-class improved facilities. Our producers adapt fairly well to fulfilling consumer expectations as far as welfare and quality is concerned. We have certain weaknesses. We have low level of government support. Actually, we have zero government support. We have, vo have volatile input costs of feeds and other raw ingredients. We have a population that is definitely not poor conscious, and a large percentage of our in indigenous population does not eat pork, mainly for religious or cultural reasons. In my opinion, we might have a little bit outdated stunning methods at abattoirs. We have very few export accredited abattoirs, and we have a varying inconsistent supply of pork. What opportunities do we have? Well, pork is cheap. It competes very well with poultry, which is the preferred meat. The changing class mobility of especially the black population, I'll speak to you about that now, supports the consumption of pork. 
We also have an increase in the local production of soya beans, which will make the industry less dependent on protein imports. And it may be possible that we could identify and procure export markets. We have certain threats. Our RAND is under, under severe pressure. So to import that 8% is actually costing us quite a lot at the moment, and that pushes up the price of pork when we actually want the consumer to buy pork because it's, ch it's, it's cheap and affordable. We have a small, vociferous, uninformed section of the community, that's the housewife, who places a lot of unnecessary expectations on, on animal welfare standards that is par for the rest of the world, and I think we understand it like anybody else. We have high levels of administered prices, unfortunately, in fuel and electricity, and our electricity supply is not looking good for the future and we may have to concentrate on improved mechanisation. Of course, I've mentioned bef before that we have the lack of government support, and we may have a waning state veterinary service, and illogical political ideologies are a big threat to agriculture in general. A few words on Africa. As a continent, it's got one of the lowest consumptions of pork in the world. Between the tip of Africa at the south, and the Mediterranean Sea in the north, there's more than one billion consumers. And there's large potential of pork consumption, possibly south of the equator in the future. Zambia, Angola, Mozambique, Kenya, Malawi, and even Zimbabwe show great promise. If you look at Africa and you look at Time magazine of about 1990, that is what you saw. And if you look at Time magazine or Newsweek today, it's slightly different. And we heard from our first speaker this morning that there are hopefully good developments for pork in Africa. The African Renaissance is happening. It's recognized as a future growth area. Agriculture is identified important. China is investing large amounts of capital. And China and pork have some sort of synonymity. Are all consumers the same? We know they are not. The local black consumer in South Africa has shied away fr from pork. It's been, it's been denounced as fatty, tasteless, dry, it's often not accessible. Beef's a market leader with an explosion in chicken consumption. The last five years have been very interesting. A few words on pork consumption and South Africa's emerging black middle class. South African black people love to eat meat. That's a little spaza shop. That's outside, and there they barbecue the meat. The middle black consumer starting to earn a lot of money. We call them the black diamonds. They love being well-dressed. They love eating well. We have uh, music festivals. We've got wine festivals. The people are very happy. And there's a tidal wave, ladies and gentlemen, of wealth acceleration. Black people's household incomes are rising rapidly. There's a dramatic impact on eating habits. But we have a, a very big problem with transport to and from home. It's a major stumbling block. So food preparation has a much lower preparation than in the past. Fast food outlets are becoming very important. And animal protein consumption is escalating. And chicken is the winner. Traditionally, we have many different and complex groupings different tribes, languages, traditions, religious, etc. Eight years ago, 55% of black consumers said they rejected pork. It's folklore, superstition, false assumptions. Currently, 42% claim they do not eat pork. These facts prove another story. The transition to eating pork is almost unconscious. Price is the biggest driving factor, plus vastly improved availability. Barbecued meat is highly desirable, and it's it's very delicious, and we have a thing which is called Shisnyama. It's the place where tasty meat is enjoyed. It's at barbecue venues, and you can see what's happening at sport events, at barber shops. There's some daily menus that we have, and it's interesting that in that Mandela family restaurant, that bacon and egg sandwiches are right at the top. It's th that's the fun that people are having. Yippee, we're eating... a a, a lot of meat and hopefully pork will be on the plate. There's some very interesting social gatherings. 
No, it's not pork. Pork is present in many foods where it's not acknowledged as pork. Bacon, ham, salami, sausages, hamburger patties, etc. Pork roasts on, buff on buffet tables and hospitality events are regarded as roasted meat and enjoyed without restraint. Upper income groups are heavy consumers of pork thanks to TV cooking programs where we have Mexican food, Alberto, and everything, you know, and that plays a big role. Um, a few things on sustainability. To look ahead, to predict maybe for the next 20 years what may come, what we do not see, T to respond to the needs of, of society, we've heard all this before, to analyze and embrace technology and investments to protect animal health. Should it really be volume, volume, volume? Do we tend to forget quality? What is the pleasurable experience of eating pork? Will the local South African population with time become pork eaters? We just need, ladies and gentlemen, 10 grams a day to double our annual consumption. And I've run out of time, but I quickly want to show you one slide. We have a quality assurance program, which is called Pork 360, and it, it is run by the producers. There are internal and external accreditation. I've got three slides left. The dichotomy of South Africa. In a recent survey, United Nations e-government survey of 2014, 146 countries, South Africa re received the second place of all the 146 countries as far as banking efficiencies were concerned, but was last on the list as far as education was concerned, and that's very sad for our country. Big farming is an output-driven business. By understanding this concept, producers have invested in the modern housing, the best genetics, good nutrition, will know that you can do very well and that such an industry is sustainable. The wonderful advantage of our, uh, our swine herd is its health. I gleaned these slides from Vijay Stein, I think he's in the audience. He delivered it last month in South Africa. That is the USA, from born to slaughtered. That is the Netherlands, from born to slaughtered. And that is South Africa, from born to slaughtered. Very, very good, as long as we could increase our born lives. Sustainability is about pork safety, welfare and health of pigs, environmental impact, sense of quality of pork, and the price of pork. Last thing, I always say to my clients, gentlemen or ladies, you need a social license to be able to farm with pork. It's something which you don't buy, you earn it. You say, trust me, I'm a pork producer. It's based on global values of compassion, respect, fairness, truth, trust, and responsibility. And it's the same for any organization, whether it be Biomin or BMW. Last slide, the future, a, st a statistic from the past. The South African per capita pork consumption was 3.2 in 1990, and that of Chile was about the same. The recent successes experienced by Chile to reach 26.6 in 2014 compared to that of South Africa of 3.8 shows us in our country just how far behind we are or it could inspire us how far we can go. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for sharing the story with me, to Byman for the invitation, vielen Dank, Hamburg Ashley, and go in peace. Thank you very much Peter Grimbeck. So you see a uh, highly professional swine producing country and an emerging market in the southern part of Africa. Really interesting. I would like to uh, keep your urgent questions for the later uh, panel discussion.